In this example, we will be uh, looking at, we will be using the technique of separation of variables to find the potential everywhere inside the square tubing where the tubing has been cut in half and the top half has been put at a positive potential plus V naught and the minus half at a negative potential minus V naught. And so I've drawn the picture here already. And so the picture kind of represents the physics of what's going on. And so we want to translate that into the mathematical problem. <coughs> now we've already, um, there's no uh, uh, charge distribution inside the area we want to find it, which is inside the tubing. And so what we can do is we can use Laplace's equation, which is minus del squared V, where V is the potential anywhere, is equal to zero. And so this is the differential equation that governs us uh, finding the, the scalar field V, which is the electric potential. And then we have the following boundary conditions. On the top and the bottom, we have uh, V naught, or V R at Y equals zero, should be equal to minus V naught. And V of R at Y equals A should be plus V naught. And then the other boundary conditions we have are on the sides. And on the sides, V at X equals zero. It's gonna be the same as on the other side, V at X equals A. And this is piecewise continuous, right? So this is um, either plus V naught if Y is greater than A over two, or it's minus V naught if Y is less than A over two. Okay. And so that's how we start out this problem. Now the first thing that we can do before we do anything else is we can say, wait a minute, the solution, if we define our coordinate axis as such, right? Y, X, and z coming out like that, then our solution should be independent of z. It shouldn't matter where along this tube we are, we should always get the same potential. So the first thing that we can say, right, is v of r should be equal to uh, v of x and y, or it's independent of z. Okay, so that's the first thing that we can do. So this is using one of the symmetries of the problem to uh, help us uh, look at the problem in a little more detail. Now the next thing that we're gonna do is, um, in order to actually solve this, we need to make the problem easier. So I'm gonna talk about the physics here. I'm gonna use these three squares to talk about the physics. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw red for the positive boundary condition, blue, for the negative boundary condition. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break this apart. So this is our combined, this is the problem that we're actually looking at. So here I want to find V total here. And I'm gonna break it apart such that into these two problems where on the sides, okay, that I've drawn in black, here I'm gonna have V equals zero on these two sides. I'm gonna do something very, very similar for this part. Again, on the sides I'm gonna have V equals zero. But this one, you can see what I've done is I've taken this part here and I've rotated it. So this is actually flipped like this. And so this is V tot of X and Y. And this is V1 of X and Y. And this is gonna be V2 of X and Y. And so I've separated the problem. And what I'm gonna have in the solutions, I'm gonna be able to combine these and I'm gonna be able to say that the total potential is equal to the potential from my system one, uh, y, plus the potential from my system two. But here I've swapped x and y from there to there and that has the effect of rotating this box. 
And so that's kind of the situation that we're looking at right now. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at solving just problem one. So let's rewrite problem one. And so starting off, we can, we can redraw problem one. Always start off with the physics. And so the picture is what I'm calling the physics in this case. And then I want to write down what the math associated with this. Again, I have minus the uh, Laplacian of this V1 is equal to zero. And now in V1 on the sides, I get that uh, V1 r x equal to zero is equal to v1 r x equal to a, which is equal to zero in both cases. And so we're going to use this one. The other part that I'm going to use, and I'm only going to write this part down for right now, I'm going to have that v1 of um, uh, y equals zero is equal to minus v1 at r at y equals a. Okay, I'm going to write that down. The fact that on one boundary it's negative of what it is on the other boundary, I'm going to use that as well. And then finally, I'm going to use the, the property, right, that uh, v1 r at y equal to 0 is equal to minus v0. And so I'll use that in the end. But for the first part, I'm going to use this and this. And how am I going to do this? Well, I'm going to do separation of variables, right? So our separation of variables always gives us these following equations. The Laplacian turns into these two, two parts, x And we have the condition between our two constants here, where the cx and the cy are constants. They're called separation constants. And they're not independent of each other. They're actually related to each other. They've got this following condition. cx plus cy must be 0. And, or cx must be minus cy. That's another way of looking at that. Um, finally, we're going to combine these two. This was actually the assumption that we started with, that v1 of x and y can be written as a product of x of x and y of y. So I'm going to look at the x part first. So I'm going to look at this guy first, the x part first. So only looking at the x component of this, so let's get this centered again. So only looking at the x component of this guy, uh, I have the boundary conditions in the x direction that x at 0 must be 0 and that x at a must be 0. Those are the boundary conditions. Um, furthermore, I know that the solutions for both x and y from this differential equation up here, this is the second derivative is equal to a constant times the function itself. It either has to be sines and cosines if that constant is negative or it has to be exponentials if that constant is positive. Because I have both uh, boundary is zero, I know it has to be sines and cosines. Um, the reason I know this is if it were exponentials and I implement these two, what I'm going to find is that the solution is that x equals zero everywhere, which is what we call the trivial solution. It's true, you plug in zero and zero, it's going to satisfy the differential equation, um, but it is not an interesting solution. It doesn't allow us to do anything with it. And so what we're going to do is look for the non-trivial solutions, which means that we're going to have to um, assume cx is less than 0, and then we're going to define k squared minus k squared is going to be the cx. When we do that, um, 
what's going to happen, right, is we can now write down the general solution for that differential equation is sine plus cosine. Use our first boundary condition. Okay, x at 0 equals 0. That's going to actually imply, right, that uh, b equals 0. That's what happens when I plug in x of 0. Sine of 0 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So a times 0 is 0. Plus b times 1 is b equal to 0. So that tells me that b is equal to 0. The second boundary condition, x evaluated at a equal to 0, is going to give me a times sine of ka is equal to 0. The interesting solutions here, right, are when ka is equal to an integer, n times pi. And here, we're going to say n is 1 or 2 or 3, done. like that. And so what we get is we do get a solution out of this. We get x of x is equal to some constant times sine of n pi over a times x. And so that's our solution in the x direction for this problem. Now we're going to try and do the same thing for the y coordinate. So for the y coordinate, we have that differential equation. And from here, we have our wonderful, uh, our, our wonderful result that uh, cx is equal to minus k squared, but we also know that cy is minus cx. So cy is going to be positive k squared. So the boundary condition we're interested for the y, I'm going to put this up here. The boundary condition I'm going to be interested for the y is capital Y, that's this condition right here, okay, that's that condition right there, capital Y evaluated at 0 must equal minus Y evaluated at A. Well, we know our general solution, right, because we have CY is equal to positive K squared, then our general solution can be written as A e to the positive KY plus B e to the negative ky. I'm going to plug that in to this equation here. It gives us a plus b, because exponential to the 0 is just 1, is equal a e to the ka plus b, oh, with a minus sign, plus b e to the minus ka. If I go and I solve this equation for b, which is what I'm going to do right now, I get this is equal to minus a 1 plus e to the positive ka divided by 1 plus e to the minus ka. Like that. Uh, plugging that in, that now gives us an expression for y. So we now have y of x of x of y. There we go, y of y is going to be equal to some constant a times, now I'm going to put brackets there, e to the n pi over a. So we're using the fact that k was equal to n pi over a now. e to the n pi over a minus, that's the minus sign there. I factored the a out, and so I have 1 plus e to the n pi divided by 1 plus e to the minus n pi. Exponential of minus n pi over a times y. And so this is the functional form of the y. Now we want to go back and we want to write down v in terms of x and y. So we have x here, we have y here, so now I'm going to combine them together. And so I'm going to write that together. v1 x and y and equal. So I'm leaving some suggestive space here. The capital A's from both of them I'm going to adapt together and I'm going to call that C for now. And this is going to equal then sine of n pi over a times x 
and then e positive n pi over a y minus 1 plus e to the minus n pi over a y. And so this doesn't look like it's very helpful for us, but it turns out this is true for every n. And so what I can do is I can say that the full solution is some sum where we have coefficient c sub n. So the full solution vi has to look like this. This is a solution to that differential equation, and that's the full solution that we need to look like. Now the term, now the goal becomes to find the c sub n. So we need to find the c sub n's. And we do that, we do that using Fourier's trick. So the first thing we need to do is we need to use that other boundary condition. And so let me, rem let me remind you of that other boundary condition. And so this is that next boundary condition that we want to evaluate. And so here we're going to say v 1x at y equals 0. This is the sum n equals 1 to infinity c sub n sine. Now I have 1 minus this guy. And this has to equal minus v naught. That's the boundary condition that we have. Now we go about using Fourier tri Fourier's trick. What does that involve? That involves multiplying both sides by sine of m pi over a instead of n pi over a. We're doing n pi over a. And so on the left hand side, I'm going to get the integral from 0 to a dx. So we're integrating over x sine of m pi over a x. Do the sum equals 1 to infinity c sub n sine n pi over a x. I'm going to try and simplify this a bit. This is 1 plus e to the minus n pi minus 1 minus e to the minus or positive n pi divided by 1 plus e to the minus n pi. This is now, again, on this side, we also need to, to multiply and integrate a minus v naught times sine of m pi over a. And so that is the expression that we have. Now we just keep on keeping on, as they say. So evaluating the the left hand side sine of m pi sine of n pi is either zero or a over two depending on if m and n are equal that picks out a single term from the sum so this is going to give me actually c m times a over two and then i evaluate this guy the ones cancel and then i have the difference here and so this is going to give me e minus n pi minus e to the n pi divided by 1 plus e to the minus n pi. And this side, we just evaluate the integral. And so this is going to give me uh, a over m pi. We have v naught. We have the minus sign. v naught a over m pi. And then sine goes to negative cosine, I believe. And so this will be minus cosine of m pi, and then plus 1, like that. And that is the integral. OK, so uh, yeah, we're looking pretty good here. So now I just need to get c alone. And so now I'm going to change dummy variables from m to n. 
because I want to plug that back in. The A's will cancel. I'm going to get a 2. Ooh, let's take a break for a moment. Let's look at this. Uh, for M equals 1, then this is going... For M equals 0, cosine of 0 is 1, so minus 1 plus 1 will give 0. For M equals 1, cosine is negative 1. That'll give 2. For M equals uh, 3, I'm back to where I started. And so this is going to be... Um, 0 for m even and 2 for m odd. So that's kind of interesting. So I can use that. And so this is cn is going to be equal. I get a 2 there. I'm going to get a 2 from here. So this is going to be 4. I get a minus sign, I believe. Minus 4 v naught over n pi. Again, I've changed from m to n. Uh, and then I divide by that guy. And so I get 1 plus e to the minus n pi divided by e to the minus n pi minus e to the positive n pi. And so the astute observer will notice that I forgot to fill these. I wrote those as n's instead of m's, which is what they should have been. So anyways, and so that's that, and so from here, I can write this final thing, that v1 of x and y will then be equal, sum, n equals 1, 3, 5, dot, 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 and then this, minus 4 v naught over n pi, 1 plus e to the minus. Okay, so I didn't leave enough room to write it, but that is the full solution for V1. Now we need to do the same thing for V2. And so let's kind of start again. Here is our picture for V1. We want to do the same thing for V2. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to start out by drawing the physics, which is the system that we start with. And again, here, I can write down the same differential equation. I have the same boundaries in the x. This is actually why I did it this way, is because this makes these two expressions identical in the x. And then, instead of getting a minus sign like I did for v1, I'm going to get a positive sign for v2. So v2, r at y equals 0, is equal to the same v2, r at y equals a. And finally, um, I get that equation, so I'm going to write it over here. v2 r at y equals 0 is this piecewise equation. It's going to be plus v naught if x is greater than a over 2, and minus v naught for x less than a over 2. And so that's what it's going to start out as. Um, and lovely, this is the exact same, exact same in the x. And so I can just write down x of x is going to be that same result I got earlier. So let's pull that up. A times sine 
of n pi over a times x. And there's some uh, stuff that we get here, which is that cx was negative, cy was positive. We had the definition that cy was equal to positive k squared and that k was equal to n pi over a. All of this came from the x component alone. And since it's identical to before, I can just use it as is. So now I'm going to go to the y part of this. And so let's get started on the y part of this. So uh, the, the uh, place to start out is we want to have our boundary condition that capital Y of 0 is equal to capital Y at A. And we know since CY is equal to positive K squared, then we can write capital Y of Y as A e to the positive KX with B e to the minus KX. Let's go ahead and plug this general expression for Y. This is the solution to the Y part of the, the uh, separation of variables equation. So to go back here, that's this one. That's just the solution to that equation. The general solution is this here. So plug that in for our boundary conditions, and we're going to find that um, a plus b is equal to a plus b, which, again, if we solve for b, this should be minus a minus e to the, uh, oops, that's an a. A e to the n pi 1 minus e to the minus n pi. Like that. And so that's the expression that we should be getting. Uh, plugging that in now, we're going to get that y of y is equal to capital A e to the positive n pi over a y minus that guy there. And that is our general solution in the y. Now we need to do the same thing that we did before, which was we need to uh, do uh, use uh, Fourier analysis, we need to do Fourier strict um, whenever we plug these together. So together, we're going to get V2 of x and y sum n equals 1 to infinity c sub n sine n pi over a times x and then times this guy. And so the way we do that is we use that final, uh, that final boundary condition. And so I might as well write that out. So the final boundary condition is v2 x0 is going to be equal to this piecewise function, which I'll write with a comma between. So this is minus v0 for x less than a over 2, and it is plus v0 for x greater than a over 2. And so writing that out, we're going to get the sum equals 1 to infinity. And then this part here is just going to be a constant. And here we get uh, this piecewise function. Now we uh, multiply both sides by the sine and integrate, just like we did last time. And so 
I'm going to stick that inside the sum already here. This goes from 0 to A over 2, to minus V naught. This goes from A over 2 to A. And that is that. So now uh, we simply have to evaluate. We know what this is, so this gets rid of the sum and is going to give us that Cm times A over 2 times this guy evaluated at n equals m. Uh, now we evaluate this, so let's be careful here. Uh, I'm going to get a minus v naught a over m pi. And then this is going to give me minus cosine of m pi over 2 plus 1. plus v naught a over m pi, and this one will give me minus cosine of m pi uh, plus cosine m pi over 2. Okay, and so uh, now comes uh, a little bit of evaluation. You have to start thinking about this. And what we find is for this part right here, actually if I factor out this stuff and I just look at the cosines, um, for m equals 0, we get uh, 1 minus 1 and minus 1, 1, those exactly cancel. For m equals 1, um, the this cosine and that cosine will cancel and we'll get 1 and minus 1 there. Um, and uh, that'll that'll cancel, and so for m equals uh, for m equals two, for m equals two, these will add together, and these will also, but they'll combine, and so this is going to give a four at m equals two, uh, at m equals two, zero, otherwise, and so this will be two six ten. Multiples of 4 because this is going to loop around and do the same thing again. And so this is going to be 4 at m equals 2, at m equals 6, at m equals 10, which that's not legible. So it would be 4 at m equals 2, 6, 10, 0 otherwise. And so um, all we have to do now is write out what c sub m is. So c sub m here is going to be, and let's see, I believe c sub m is going to be minus 8 v naught over m pi. I'm not sure why I left this one m and had the last one go to n, but it is what it is. And then I'm going to divide out this term, but this term simplifies, which I didn't do last time, but this one does. 1 uh, minus e to the minus m pi divided by e to the m pi minus e to the minus m pi.
There we go. Okay, so we have that. And finally, we stick it together. You get V2 of X and Y this is going to be then this. N equals 2, 4, 6, dot, 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 not uh, N is equal to 2, 6, 10, dot, dot, dot. And uh, let's write down what we have. So minus 8 V naught over N pi. 1 minus exponential of minus M pi. Sine of n pi over a times x, and then we get exponential of positive n pi over a times y minus one minus exponential of n pi. Oh, those are n's, n's, n, n. N pi exponential minus minus n pi value. Okay, and so that's the grand solution for V two. Now, that's a lot of math, and so what does it do to us? Well, it actually lets us uh, do some some nice calculation if we can then get a computer to do some of the evaluation here. And so here is an example of um, those two solutions. So here, this is V2. I've got the minus eight pi over, eight V naught over N pi. Got that term, the sine and the exponentials with the minuses in them. And then here is V1, is very similar, uh, but it's got the minus four instead of the eight. And this one goes every two, that's what this two here is. The other one goes every four, that's what that is. And so I just left these together. And then I have the equation I had before that if I add V1 and V2 and I swap X and Y on V2, I should get back my original. And that is a contour plot. The warm colors are high potential. The cool colors are low potential. So that's what the potential looks like inside this square. Okay, so that was a big long uh, process. Um, hopefully that helped illustrate a little bit of the process of how to do separation of variables.